Good afternoon, everybody. Being that it's time, we are being audio and video recorded with minutes to boot. And this is the Ordinance Committee. I'm Councillor David Murphy, Councillor Maureen Carney, and Councillor Ryan O'Dell. And let's talk about video recording. <coughs> We're called to order. Is there any general public comment? Or people are welcome to wait until we're discussing a specific item and comment on it then. But if anybody wants to make a general public comment, now would be the time. Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, I'll move approval of the minutes of April 14th. Uh, I second that. Any discussions? Any corrections? All in favor? Aye. Aye. I would just quick, quickly note that they're not the mix. They're, they're the ones that um, Pamela took. Because the ones you took, I think, were misplaced. So just so you realize that. That's fine if you took them off the tape. I did. Okay. They're probably better than yours. That's, they could be better than mine. So Al's submitted by Pamela Courtesy of our video. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now we have. Oh, sorry. Aye. 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 Um, do you mind if we fiddle with the order, order a little bit? Because we have people here for some things, and I'd love to get them moving before the public hearing starts. <clears throat> so we have a couple of appointments, and I think uh, Teresa Poe. I don't know if very much. Not quite yet. Okay, well, we'll skip that one. Uh, then Margaret LaSalle and Chestnut Street, Florence, to a term on the Council on Aging. Mm -hmm. I, um, I spoke with Ms. LaSalle a couple weeks ago, and she described her background um, working among, in, among other jobs with the district attorney uh, with an elderly population on certain uh, victims' issues, and I found her to be very knowledgeable and a, a good fit for this position. So. I certainly would recommend her for this appointment. I'll move to recommend uh, the appointment of Margaret Lassell to the Council on Aging. Right. Second. Very good. Any more discussion on Margaret? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And I'll note that I did speak with uh, Lorraine Wyman. Um, she's, and she's also for Council on Aging. Also for the Council on Aging. Um, I spoke with her today. Uh, and when I wasn't sure if I would reach her, I actually reached out and spoke to the director of the Council on Aging, Pat O'Shaughnessy, um, who spoke very highly of Lorraine's involvement currently as a volunteer at the Senior Center and at the annual dinner and many, many other civic, um, uh, civically focused uh, activities on this way for its part. I then spoke with Lorraine Wyman, who was very excited for the appointment, um, was really looking forward to serving on the council, and I thank her for her interest. So uh, I would recommend that we move forward. I have a second. Mm -hmm. Very good. Any more discussion on uh, Lorraine? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that's unanimous. Um, and so we don't, since we don't have Teresa yet, <coughs> I think we have some people here for item number 10 and 11 on the agenda dealing with Maple Street. So let's do, uh, let's do 10 first. That's amend uh, section 312.102, parking prohibited all times on Maple Street. We have that one we were talking about. And I believe we have at least two people here to speak about that, correct? Great. Yeah, Great. Okay. So please come forward and just give us your name and address for the video record, and then we'll take your comment. Uh, uh, yeah, my, my name is Alex Bublik, uh, transportation engineer for DPW. Uh, Councillor uh, Lorene Olobarge and uh, Director of uh, Commission of Disability. Uh, they asked me to find two parking spaces on uh, North Main Street in Florence, or Main Street in Florence. Currently we have one. Uh, it's near intersection Maple and uh, Main Street. Uh, it's not marked. I did put a work order, so it should be marked hopefully in a month or so. Uh, and second uh, parking space is on Maple Street. It's on uh, Westerly side, 
uh, first parking space from intersection of uh, Maple and Main Street. And pretty much all these three audiences is for one parking space. Uh, I'm not sure how I can talk about specific one if it's like <coughs> all three. So is this for handicap space? Yes. And uh, all three actually for handicap space. Okay. So, so we have to put it in. Right now we have uh, no parking uh, from intersection 55 feet into Maple Street mm -hmm. and then we have a limited parking for one hour uh, from 55 feet and the rest of it. So, so the first parking space which is starts 55 feet and uh, we uh, put it as a handicap. Since uh, we have a tree right in front of uh, first space, we had to make it a little bit wider and longer. So that's why I had to make ordinance 312, 102. So it used to be 55 feet from intersection, right now it's 48. From uh, 40, 48 feet, we have a handicap parking space, which is ordinance uh, 312, 117. And uh, handicap space is 24 feet long. And uh, after handicap, uh, I have audience 112, 104, which is saying uh, from handicap and all the way through 50. Right, so 72 feet is where it comes, becomes limited. The second ordinance is. Second ordinance is. 312, 117, that's for handicap space. Mm -hmm. Instead of 55 feet, it's 72 feet. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. So that's, that's the end of the handicap. Yes. And that's where the limited part is. Yes. There's been a problem up in Florence for the past couple of years. And Pat Shaughnessy and I have done several site visits. And there was kind of a halt on this. And I don't want to go into details about it. But now we're pushing it. I have received many calls within the past couple of years from residents throughout the town of Florence in regards of handicap parking being placed right around, well, it's almost like in front of Bird's store, and because of our elderly people and so forth, and even with families who have children who are disabled of having handicap parking. We also applied for handicap parking in front of the Florence Diner, and that has been approved. We're waiting for the sign to be placed at some point to go up there, which will be like opening the doors for people now to go to the post office. And believe me, we're in dire need of handicapped parking in Florence, just like we are for benches on the sidewalks, and hopefully we can open those doors on that. But I thank you for listening. Okay, thank you. your next. So just to add to that, um, Alex uh, did come up to uh, Lawrence to do a site visit with us and um, we wanted two parking spaces, one in front of the diner, which after we left the meeting, Alex did find out that there was already an ordinance in place to have a parking spot there for handicapped parking. Um, so um, I think what Alex had said, uh, in about a month there will be a parking um, handicap sign there. And then the other one um, is the one that you're talking about tonight um, on Maple Street. So if you're on Maple Street and you want to go in the door to Birds, it's right there. Um, and as Alex mentioned, there's a tree there, and hence the reason to have to move it a little bit. But um, uh, as Council of Birds said, she's gotten phone calls about additional handicap parking in Florence. Um, and um, as the uh, ADA coordinator, I've received phone calls as well. Um, and 
several years ago, um, we were able to get that handicapped parking space on High Street that's right next to the bank. So that's what we're looking at at the handicapped parking uh, on one of our city streets. Now we'll have three um, from Main Street to um, Maple Street. So thanks for your consideration for that. And uh, Jasper, you want to speak on the subject? So I am uh, supportive of the idea of having handicapped parking spaces in strategically placed locations. The need for them is obvious. Um, so I, I also just want to want to lend an additional voice to say yes, this is something we should have. Yes, we should have it immediately. We should expedite the process because it's something that's been in need for quite some time. My only concern is that uh, here's what happens in Florence. Um, this is New England. In the winter, it snows. Um, Florence has a civic association, but they don't have a bid. The sidewalks are are cleared if they are, by the businesses. And my experience has been in Florence on Main Street, the businesses are pretty good at getting it done in a timely fashion. We're talking about the intersection of Maple Street and Main Street. Here's what happens on Maple Street and Main Street. I'm going to step out uh, from the podium so that you can see, although there's no camera on me. There's the curb, and then there's the snow pile that's on the, on, on the street side of the curb, because that's the way that the, the plows are done. And the plow goes out, and then there's this corner, and there's a big mound of snow with a uh, puddle of melted salt water behind it. And that stays there from December until March, depending on how much snow there is. You can have as many handicapped spaces as you want to. If they can't get up on the sidewalk, they're kind of meaningless for those three months. And so I would recommend that if you're going to uh, do that, that there's some way that they can be used by handicapped people in the winter as well. I don't know what that is. It's not something that the city of Northampton really addresses well anywhere else. But if you're specifically thinking about a handicapped spot, it might be worth considering how that could be done. Thank you. <clears throat> Any more comment on this Maple Street handicapped parking? <clears throat> yes. Um, I, I need, I don't recall this going to the Transportation and Parking Commission. It did not. And I, I don't believe it was. And I, I went back and checked the minutes. And I don't think it was referred on April 17th. Um, okay, that's my oversight for not jumping in. Um, Councilor, I don't know. Councilor what? It was brought, referred to City Council. And the recommendation that night was to be sent to ordinance. You were there that night, Councilor. You should have suggested it going to parking. Yeah, in, indeed. Um, well, my only um, hesitation is if, if my error amounts to, to bad process, if we should still have to go through Transportation and Parking Commission. Since it, if I had remembered, it would have, it would have done that anyway. Maybe a question about that. When, when does the meeting? Now it's going to be uh, for, um, for Tuesday. It's next going to be on uh, the twentieth, uh, next Tuesday. Is it is it possible to get this on the agenda by? It can certainly be on the agenda. Yes. And then I would, since this wouldn't halt the process at all, um, I'd maybe you know, even though we ordinarily only deal with things after they come back from Christmas. Oh, you know something. If we're going to send it, if we're going to send it there, we're going to meet again beginning of, beginning of June, and we probably want to send the next one too. 10, 11, and 12 are all tied together, so we probably want to send all. Of them. Do we have, can we get yeah. that from this committee, or don't we need to send it back to the council and have it referred at that point? Which can happen Thursday. I mean, that's just a quick question. Is that how the procedure goes? We certainly can ask them to react on it. I mean, I don't think it, I don't think there's any question that we're going to go along with it if PMP goes along. But I do agree with right. your concern about process that they haven't seen it. They really should right. see it. Right. We don't want to get in the habit of. And I do believe the next. Anything. I do believe the next meeting after April 17th, when this was originally referred here, is still the 20th. So in fact, we have, we're not losing any time that we would have. Right, that's right. It would be the same amount of time. Yeah. yeah, it's exactly the same amount of time as it would have been. So it's not appropriately referred. Said, where's it going? Well, okay, so in terms of what it happened,
have to then come back to us. Where the, you're saying that we're going to meet again before? We're going to meet again. We meet second on Monday. And I don't remember the, the layout of the calendar, but we probably would not come back. We, we, we see it and then we go to the second meeting. Do you think that we might have to have an additional meeting? Additional well, we won't know for the look. We're done with our joint public hearing, I don't think. But I, I would, I think I would concur that there's no reason to to disarm process since right. this is the purview of transportation and parking. And I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable with it, but if, if, if transportation and parking wants to tweak it, then we really should respect the right to do that. So if you want to move to continue until it goes there, you know, you're right, practically we're not going to lose any time. But I, I think seeing as we're not going to lose any time, uh, I think we should do that. So, uh, okay. To same continue until after the transportation and parking. So is it coming just, back to ordinance? Yeah. So can you just review what this what what is going to happen? What the process is now? It's right. going so would, it would be approved then at the June our June meeting. So we will continue it to our June meeting. Okay. It will go to the next transportation and parking, which Councilor O'Donnell okay. chairs, which is what the twentieth. The twentieth. Twentieth of June. Next week. Oh, okay. Next week. So it will go to them next week, and we'll come back to our our meeting in June, okay. and. Uh, and then we'll deal with it then, and then it can go, and then it go probably the second meeting in June for council, because we'll have right. already had the first meeting. Right, so it's, only, it, it's a difference, of, it could be a difference of two weeks. Yeah, okay, at the most, probably. Yeah, so instead of the June 5th meeting, it would be the June 19th meeting. Mm -hmm. Two weeks. Okay. So there would be a first reading in On June, June and then, mm -hmm. now July, right? June 19th would be the first reading. And then the second reading in, uh, in July. Yep. July. So it's right now it's taking us several months just to get one in front of um, the Florence Diner. Okay. Yeah. Well, that one exists, doesn't it? They, yeah. That needs a sign. I think, yeah, that's what it is. Right, we've yeah. been waiting. That was, that, that's we've been waiting one year for anymore. that sign. Yeah. There we go. All right, so we've got a motion to continue to our next meeting. I'll move that. And you're seconding. All in favor? Um, okay, so that's 10, 11, and 12. Yeah, make sure it gets referred to transportation at Thursday night. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good. So, um, back to Teresa Ho. Ah, you're here. I am. Hi, come on, come on up. You're doing well before our public hearing. How are you? Good afternoon. So, um, Teresa Ho has been referred to us to join the planning board. Mm -hmm. And if you stick around, you'll see the planning board in action. Because we're at the joint public hearing at 5.30. Um, so please tell us some, some of your interests, and we'll ask you some questions. Sure. Um, I'm a small business owner here in town. I'm Beehive Sewing down on Pleasant Street. Um, prior to opening Beehive Sewing, I was a full-time employee with Beehive Sewing. And I started working with them in 1998. See you all the time, my professors. You may or not remember. Uh, and uh, so I. Oh, right into sewing. I, I, <laughs> I was going to say. Well, I can tell you more about the planning connection. I, I actually did a lot of research on shared professional office spaces and people who work from home and telecommute, which led to a lot of research on shared creative space. And so that's the origin of Beehive and looking at different models of how people use space and have some sort of experiential retail here in town. Um, I used to work for the U.S. Department of Transportation as a community planner and researcher out in Cambridge uh, and spent some time working here in the Valley with the Planning Commission in West Springfield, the city of Chicopee, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I currently serve on the board of the Northampton Center for the Arts. Um, I also have served on the Mayor's Economic Development Advisory Commission for the last couple months. Okay. I love planning. And so and sewing. So, uh, sewing, you know, I do a lot of other things, that's, uh, but sewing is one of them. Uh, questions, please. Well, I, I was, and thank you for appearing here today, by the way. And I was impressed with um, Ms. Poe as one of the co-organizers of a recent event we had uh, in Ward 3 with Pleasant Futures, which was um, uh, put on jointly with the Department of Planning. And I just wonder if you would just talk very briefly about your work on that and, and how how that fits into your vision of the city. Sure, so I um, live on the north side of the city. I live on Masonic Street. I own a condo downtown here in a mixed use building. I selected the building that Beehive is housed in because it's also in a mixed use area, Pleasant Street, 
seem to have a lot of opportunity. Um, I've just been really interested in the redevelopment of Pleasant Street and how we sort of expand our Main Street downtown feel. Um, I became connected with Ryan when Beehive was having its grand opening, its ribbon cutting last year. He was there, the mayor was there, city councilors were there. Um, and then more recently, I got connected with Bob Reckman and Jim Nash and um, just began working with the OPS in developing that forum. So I was very instrumental in working to get business owners um, and people who own property on Pleasant Street but don't live here to try to come to that forum. So those are the people who can make investments in the street, and that's the, that's the idea. your application and thank you for being willing to serve on a hard working <laughs> work. So I, I would like to move uh, a positive recommendation for this post point. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Congratulations. Thank, thank you, you for much. volunteering the place. Appreciate it. I did ask for flowers. I don't see flowers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So now, uh, we have another celebrity guest in the audience, uh, Councillor Adams, who has uh, something before us, and I think we can get that done too before. And uh, I'll, I'll read it, order to change council rule three. Upon the recommendation of Councillor Jesse M. Adams, order that the following change to the city council rules are adopted. Uh, three is the suspension of council rules. The suspension of these rules or any part thereof shall require a two-thirds majority of the forum present. Nothing in here. In, herein shall be construed to authorize suspension of any other provision of the charter, the city of Northampton, or of any ordinance of the city of Northampton, or of any federal or state statute, rule, or regulation. Uh, Councilor Adam, do you want to come talk about this? Thank you. I forgot that was on. Came right from training, I see. That was when I was reading the charter one day, I noticed that we can't suspend any appointments, whether they're by from the department heads or multiple member bodies, and I noticed that we've done that in the past. Uh, so I wanted to codify that we can't do that anymore in the future because it'd be breaking the rules. And um, and I drafted something that that was uh, not what you see before you, Attorney Seawall, uh, helped me come up with that language, which is more inclusive uh, of. Uh, of how we basically can't ever suspend any rule that um, would result in suspending one of those um, authorities' rules, which we can't do. But this one says requires two thirds majority of the quorum present. Well, that, that's an old that's an old change. That's an old that's old. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that, that's not part of the change. Right? Right. That's capital. It's, it's, it's this part that's right. Here. So the, the, it is the nothing you're in. That's all. Good. That's right. Yeah. Because we can't suspend a charter, we can't suspend the ordinances, and we can't suspend state or federal laws. Right. All right. I move that forward with the possibility. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Yeah. <coughs> we have some new uh, play word members. Um, Carol, would you let us know when we're uh, everybody's here? We're going to keep going and doing our, oh, okay. sure. our agenda and then let us know. We can take a little break for everybody to get set up. So okay, perfect. That takes care of that when we come to the screen. All right, and so let's, we're down to 13. Amend 312.82 crossing roadway. Um, but the point of this, this was brought by the Department of Public Works. 
um, it was, it's kind of a technical upgrade to the old ordinances that governs how crosswalks work. It simply says that they have to comply with federal uh, standards governing their design. Um, and inherent in that is the understanding that we're talking about a new crosswalks. So if you have old ones laying around that are not in compliance, that is not an a problem for us. It's just going forward. And rather than read the, uh, well, I might as well read the crossing road. I'll read the whole thing, and I'll read the two changes. Just so we have, we get the time to do that. So uh, currently, crossing roadway says pedestrians shall obey the direction of police officers directing traffic, and whenever or uh, whenever. There is an officer directing traffic, a traffic control signal or a marked walk cross off within 300 feet of a pedestrian. No such pedestrian shall cross a way or roadway except within the limits of the marked crosswalk. Uh, and as hereafter provided in these regulations, for the purpose of these regulations, a marked crosswalk shall only be construed to be that area of roadway reserved for pedestrian crossing. It used to say located between two solid white reflectorized 12-inch pavement markings and in rural, er in rural areas were markings not less than six inches wide in urban areas, set markings or lines being no less than six feet apart. It is now going to say, all signage and crosswalks shall comply with the latest manual on uniform traffic control devices and standards and the Massachusetts, um, what's that acronym? And, and amendments of the Uniform Traffic Control Devices standards in Massachusetts. So rather than defining crosswalks, we're just going to refer to the manual. Right. Okay. Do we have a recommendation? Right. 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 All right, on, on 353-4, the rezoning of all conservation lands, uh, farms, forests, and rivers, have, has that gone to, Carolyn, is that? Um, farms, forests, and rivers for conservation land, that hasn't come back from the planning board yet, has it? Uh, we have not um, done the public hearing on, uh, no, we have not okay. done that yet. And it went to Edlu. I don't think Edlou's done it yet. I think you know. Oh uh, yes. Edlou did. Did you come and say anything? It just came out of council. What? Yeah. So yeah. I don't think anybody's done it. No. You just did. Did you just meet? Oh, when, so maybe when they met this week. Last week. Last Tuesday. Oh. Okay. But planning for it. Yeah. Okay. So it should be. We continue that one till. And that gets us down to new business prior to the public hearing. Anybody get any new business? Well, that's, I think that's what we're, I think that's our public hearing. No, but that's our our public hearing is about rezoning. Oh, that goes in here as well. Yeah, that, that's up in the public hearing. Yes, sir. Did you have Tess on the agenda? What? Tess Poe. Is she on the agenda before you go she, into hearing? She's already we missed had it. Oh, okay, never mind. We didn't see a crown or any sash, okay. no bouquet. Can we now? A little. Before we start the public hearing, we want to have a small celebration. Yeah. <laughs> Where would you like me? I was here. come back with We have all sorts of celebrity guests any questions on the ordinance itself as we get going. So, um, we have, we all come before we finish the rest of the test, correct? So, we'll go right into the public hearing. Um, so, do we have a, an ordinance, a motion to open the public hearing? 
So we introduced ourselves before the three of us are a council ordinance committee, Councilor Murphy, Councilor Adal, Councilor Carney, and Nisha Irish Law, we are up here. And uh, I'm going to ask the planning board to introduce themselves. Uh, Devin Bruce, Ann Brooks, Carla Youngblood, Philip Grinnell, Anna Long Person, John Lutz. And again, turn to see what. And Kayla Powers is the executive assistant to the city council, and she's taking minutes. To, uh, so our public hearing this evening, um, and again, I'll remind everybody that wasn't here earlier, we are being audio and video recorded, and minutes are being taken. So we will, uh, we will be well documented. And if we're doing three ordinances tonight, we're going to amend 350G, replacement of a moratorium of construction of seven or more units in URB. We're going to do 350H, replacement of a moratorium on construction of seven units or more in URC. And Ordinance 357-4, uh, signs permitted in any B district, projecting blade signs and standard wall signs by right. So we're going to do those three things. But we'll start off with um, 350G, replacement of a moratorium of construction of seven or more units in B. And I, I think what we'll do is have Carolyn Mish do a presentation on what it is we're talking about and so that everybody's on the same footing and uh, and then we'll deal with the comment. Oops, we're getting technically connected. No spark. is just what's allowed in C versus B. So I think it probably makes sense to generally talk about both together. Yeah, if that's okay. Oh, that's fine. Okay. Um, let's see. So I just want to go over, um, there are basically two components to the, um, to the amendments in front of you. One is um, a minor a change which would clarify that site plan approval is required anytime you add a detached, a separate residential structure to a property that already contains a single family or a two family. Um, there were some, um, since the original adoption of the ordinances, there were some, um, it, it was sort of discovered that it probably made sense to have planning board review those um, conditions where you already have an existing structure, no matter what the square footage is, if you're adding another unit to a property, just to make sure it all fits within the criteria. So there are two pieces to this, um, these ordinances ahead in front of you. And the other is to um, replace the moratorium language that was adopted in September before the moratorium runs out in July um, of this year. Um, and um, then, so there are specific special permit criteria related to that. Okay, there's AB problem number one. Um, So, everybody's memory back in September um, there were some um, changes made to your urban residential A, B, and C districts um, that related to that also incorporated design and density standards at that time a special permit criteria was established um, when there were situations that where seven or more units were going to be created on a property 
And also at that time, there was a separate threshold within that. If you were building 10 or more units, there were two components that were specific special permit criteria that related to designing layout access ways, um, looking at natural features of a property, and compliance with design and construction material standards that are consistent with what we require in a subdivision review. Um, but through that process, there was also a moratorium that was adopted on the <coughs> establishment of seven or more units that um, is due to expire July of this year. Um, so what happened after that was adopted. We got through some other modifications um, in zoning, and then the planning board came back to address this moratorium question and what kind of more specific standards were necessary above and beyond what had already been adopted for construction of all units starting from single family moving forward up to um, six units. Um, so to do that, Initially, staff had um, informal discussions with um, some representatives from Ward 3, um, <coughs> Councillor Dwight. We had, a four, we had a community meeting in early, earlier this year with um, residents of Ward 3 and 4 focused on the redevelopment of um, the um, Fort Hill property, Smith Lyman Estate. Um, and then from those meetings, we gathered information and brought it to the, plan the planning board. Actually, some members were also at that um, Fort Hill community meeting. <coughs> and then the planning board sort of dove in and looked at different ways to address the comments that we received through that process after September. Um, again, sort of going back over the standards that were adopted in September for all units, starting with single family, there um, is a focus on how those structures um, front on the streetscape and present to that and, and a real interest in ensuring that there's a fit within the neighborhood r relative to massing, the parking layout, landscaping buffers, um, and the way um, structures are configured in existing neighborhoods. So now we're approaching the, um, the moratorium expiration date and we currently also have design standards in general site plan approval criteria relative to landscaping and other things, but based on the comments that we received earlier this year, we're trying to incorporate more specificity as it uh, relates to those special permit um, conditions where you're creating, or someone might be creating more than seven units. So um, there are seven to eight. We've been um, looking at these actually since the introduction of the ordinance um, back in March, I want to say, um, there's been continuous conversation with members, most particularly with Ward, and three, Ward 3 and 4 um, counselors, and so we've even gone further than what you had originally seen in the introduction at City Council to try to address comments. Um, and I want to go over those specific things. And then, um, but generally, the other thing we wanted to do in this is to make, to simplify it a bit and not have two different standards within the special permit, but just make all the new standards that would be adopted as a replacement to the moratorium to apply to seven units and not, and so bringing that threshold down from ten units for certain standards, um, just have everything apply at seven. Um, so I think I, I, went, I went over generally the the issue about um, that first um, item was creating a site plan approval process for the additional new, new structures. And that's really just a concern that we, we felt like that we hadn't thought about that. So I think that's pretty straightforward, but I'd be happy to answer any questions about why that's there. Um, um, but I, there's, not, there's not a whole lot of other detail about that except to just trigger that review. This is a good time for the public trust, but I have a question. But, um, why don't you, we'll have her finish her presentation and then just take questions on the whole thing before we you know, don't get started. So, moving on to the um, additional special permit criteria that would apply to the creation or, um, or construction of seven or more units within um, the B and C district. And what we're talking about is in urban residential C, we, we allow, it's our most dense neighborhood, it's always been that way, we allow multifamily um, units. In urban residential B, we're really talking about townhouse configurations where you've got side-by-side -side units as opposed to potentially buildings where you have one unit on top of another. Um, 
but in any case, under either scenario, um, there are additional streetscape standards that we've added, um, and uh, focus on a more focus on building orientation in the relationship to um, the street front and the access and connectivity to the street front. Um, creating, ensuring that there is adequate pedestrian access from the street to any of these projects that might come about. Um, and then connectivity in between and in the project, you know, as an example of um, the Lyman Estate is many, many acres, and so there might actually be a street grid or some, you know, couple of streets that would be um, that could be designed in that situation, and so under that scenario, we'd really want to make sure that there was internal pedestrian and vehicular connection as well as connection to the existing neighborhood, so we're not creating these closed-off enclaves um, in these new projects. Uh, there's also, we addressed some concerns about um, open space, and specifically there's some standards about uh, creating park space or a civic focal point in these projects that's really well thought out and designed, not just a piece of grass or a square of grass, but it really has to be um, something that brings to life that, that property. Um, and then we heard a lot about interest in creating additional energy efficiency standards um, and also affordable housing or small um, um, cottage type housing, so re requiring um, a concept of addressing both of those issues by creating um, sort of a pick list of things that um, someone could choose from and to meet those goals. And then we also added a, um, a bit about phasing and allowing, because this is a special permit, um, many times applicants want to know, well, are they going to have a project? And they want to know that before they spend thousands of dollars on engineering. So this um, language in the proposal would allow um, for a general special permit um, before delving into all the detailed engineering studies so that the applicant has some comfort that overall the concept is acceptable and the devil is essentially in the details. Um, and then I want to go over some suggested changes since this has been introduced, and I'll, I know um, Councilor Donald um, will want to speak to those changes that he has proposed um, to address further address um, concerns of um, his constituency. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I don't know. I got pretty detailed in the specific standards in this presentation, but if um, so, if you want me to go over in more detail or, or not be so detailed, I can do either one. So I don't know how familiar you are with the, um, the proposal, but I was going to go through each piece. Mm -hmm. okay. Please. And then uh, I'd like you to go through that and then anything that's come up since, because before we start public comment, I want, want to make sure we've presented to the public yeah. everything that's on the table so we can collect comment on, every, on everything. Sure. Um, so this first standard is um, creating additional streetscape design by requiring that buildings, um, the, the original design standards do require the front, front of buildings to face the street, but this standard goes into a little bit more detail and requires um, the first row of buildings to face the tr street and add to the streetscape um, and specify that there shall not be any parking between the street and the first row of building. Um, except for creation of an access driveway. Um, we've added some clarity, which I can go over um, later, about what that means in terms of, um, you know, basically just minimizing the view of parking from the street so it really blends, so any new structure blends into the neighborhood. <clears throat> um, and also these driveways and connections to really connect directly to the street so it functions just as other structures in the neighborhood. Um, in terms of street connectivity, again, uh, the overall concept is to um, ensure um, pedestrian friendly streetscapes between the properties and through the properties, um, that driveways, um, all projects shall and, and ensure that the sidewalks connect inside the project as well as to the public street. Um, and um, 
we want to make sure that if there are driveways or public streets uh, or streets, um, whether they're public or private, that they're designed the same way we would require the design and under our subdivision rules, so that they would be classified as either private alleys, shared streets, or yield streets. And there are very specific design criteria in subdivision rules that um, that um, talk about how you do that, what the dimensions are, and what kind of sidewalk and what the construction materials are for that. Um, again, this is more detailed about the how those interior, internal pedestrian um, connections work. Um, and it's really, they're meant to be very slow um, speed roadways or driveway access points. Um, and potentially, you know, they can be designed in various ways, but the idea is not to create lots of pavement um, and thereby establishing sort of a, that sort of sets the tone for the project that the, you know, it's, it's a shared space of pedestrians and vehicle vehicles. Um, we've added, so in terms of park and civic space, um, all projects of this size, should it, shall include a park or civic space that serves as a focal point that's easily accessible and available and desirable. And um, we've added a specific standard um, since this introduction because we heard that people wanted to have more specificity of what a minimum standard would be. Um, so we can talk a little bit more about that too, but we've come up with 10 um, square feet per dwelling unit. Um, and potentially it could be smaller if it's there's some compelling design reason to have it smaller and, um, and I think Councilor Donald will speak to this, um, that if it's dedicated um, as open and available to the public. Um, there's incorporation of building, uh, there was a concern about how buildings um, relate along their side properties. So the idea is to create um, and incorporate articulation along building facades that are longer than 30 feet so that you're not just creating sort of these walled off structures next to or, you know, sandwiched in between existing um, residential lots. Um, and then a requirement that front facades sort of reflect what the neighborhood already is in terms of setbacks. So, the idea is you're really going in and you're designing based on the context of the neighborhood and not necessarily something that you pull out of a design book that you say, I think this works in Northampton somewhere, I'll find a spot for it. <clears throat> um, and but this again is sort of flexible criteria because every site is different and there might be some natural resource constraints that might limit having you know, precisely the same setbacks as a bunch of parcels. And then we sort of, we get to, um, this energy, this concern about um, creating a greater energy standard for these projects, people are coming in to build. Um, what was introduced was um, a pick list of um, five items um, that you either have to meet um, a home energy rating system uh, rating of originally it was 45. We've been tinkering with that based on data um, that we have existing for structures in Northampton or um, residential structures, I should say. So I have 41 up here. That represents a modification since originally introduced. Um, and then the other option was um, or to create a um, structures that meet the LEED Gold um, certification or um, create um, at least 15% of the units to be permanently protected as affordable housing, um, or 50% of the units no larger than 1,200 square, well, I should be here, I guess. Close <laughs> that out, sorry about that. Um, or some combination of those, and, and there's a proposal, uh, I think Councilor Donald will talk to that about sort of modifying this a bit. Um, and then we talked about phasing, it's really allow um, um, applicants to have uh, a sense that their project is a go before they spend thousands of dollars on, on engineering costs. Um, so I'll, what I want to also clarify, and I, I have um, six copies here, maybe I'll send it down. Um, were you able to print out any of those images I emailed to you earlier today for the highlights? I have a few copies here. Um, of changes 
just so you can see them in writing. Um, I'll pass um, the breeze down there on the other side too. Um, Um, but these just the, red, the yellow highlights just. I need that one. Sorry, just mark that. Let me get you. That's something different. What's that? Yeah, it's just the. Are, are there some of those for the public as well? That's probably. Oh, okay. Yeah, I have one. Okay. But I can also put it up on okay. screen. That was my plan. Um. So. I just wanted to, um, and I'll put it up on the screen. Basically, everything that's highlighted in yellow are tweaks that we've made since this was introduced back in March. Um, and I'm going to put that a little bit on the screen now. Um, So this is um, urban residential C. The again, the language is the same for this section because it's all about the special permit um, approval. So um, with this uh, this first bullet item, oops, sorry. Um, we wanted there were there are twofold two purposes really for changing. Item one, which was to um, clarify, we heard in the public that uh, comments last week that um, maybe there wasn't this language should be could be cleaned up. So we really specified that parking should be located behind buildings or designed otherwise to minimize the view from the public street. Just to be very clear about what the goal is, and um, then. Councilor Donald suggested that we also okay. address more specifically um, that the goal would be at the same time of blocking public view into parking lots. The whole idea is still to ensure that projects um, are not insulated from the adjacent streets, so we're not creating these walled off situations. Um, but we're actually incorporating these projects into the neighborhood. So, uh, you know, feel free to add to that. Um, yeah, can I jump in? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, if I could just take a couple steps back quickly and, and kind of report on the forum that Ward 3 and 4 had uh, last Monday, as, as you started to. Um, we did do a kind of informal um, discussion. Um, uh, Wayne, uh, Director Biden was there. And um, to characterize it, um, you know, there was there were comments of all kinds, and in fact, there was lots of comments about the zoning reform <coughs> that we did pass, that the council passed last year. Um, but some of the specific things um, included uh, the ways that that driveways and, and, and sidewalks might look um, if we, if you have a development of seven more units that's coming off the street. And one of the things that I heard was that there's a desire to make sure that the sidewalks connect to the sidewalks of the adjacent streets. And you'll, I believe we'll get to that when we talk um, about another amendment later, down, later in this, uh, on this document. Um, but also that we're not creating uh, communities that, that are, are walled off and, and separate and feel like they're not part of the city. That was a major concern that I heard. And when we talk about potential large developments, I think that concern becomes even more important. So that was the motivation behind that change. Um, I guess I guess we should just go point by point and continue since you started to go through this. And, yeah. Okay. I just want to add um, just um, this up just now this evening. Um, um, City Solicitor Seawald had suggested a couple more um, changes to this one bullet item, which is two, or actually just one here, and then um, one change to the next one is to delete the term to the extent possible because um, you can speak to this more, uh, Councilor, if you um, would like, but um, 
the it's really about um, clarifying, and since there's no specific language about what to the extent possible is, that and it's just sort of an extra tag on. So just to delete that would make it cleaner. And so that is um, right here. So I would just recommend from here to here, just ending the sentence after a landscape, or a streetscape, sorry. I think that's important. <laughs> and then under bullet two, um, he also suggested that, in, that this should be, instead of um, Road, road pavement, pedestrian friendly, and in conformance with city best practices, that it should just be in conformance with city standards. So, um, if you would put that in the bucket too to consider. Yeah. yeah. So, how is uh, beginning with all projects, how would that read since there's a strike through with insurance? Oh, it should be, yeah. It's that, it should be gone too. All projects shall. Um, oh, weird. Well, um, well, all, all projects shall connect to the street. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm going to say. Thanks for yeah, having that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's what I was alluding to. Um, the second part of, of the challenge of making sure we're not building just dead-end parking lots is we want to make sure the sidewalks that we build along those roadways or driveways do connect to the street to make, make it feel like it's part of the city. So, oh, so it's we simply added, um, well, this, this bullet, can I, I'll just read the whole thing for a yeah. Uh, driveways and roadways shall either have separate sidewalks to be designed to shared streets focused on pedestrians and bicyclists and engineered to keep speeds below 15 miles per hour. So there's kind of two models that could be chosen. One is a model with sidewalks and the other is this proposal to have a shared street concept with slow traffic. But if you do have sidewalks, um, then they simply must connect to the sidewalks that already exist. And it's simple, but I think it's, I think it's important. Um, so this is the standard um, item four of, of related to parks. All projects shall include a park or civic space. We just added, I think many times it's obvious, but maybe for some folks building these things, um, we're gonna make sure they understand that they have to design it, fully design it and actually construct it. Um, and then the bottom part of that is, um, is, um, and I think Councillor Donnelly, you can speak to that as well, is sort of creating more specificity about size so that there is a minimum standard, it's not just left. Right, this was a specific comment that came out of the forum last Monday that I heard, uh, which was, it's great to create civic and park space, but we want to actually put some numbers to that and define it. Because previously, you could say that a, a shared focal point of a development could be a bench. You know? It could be something like that. And so we wanted to put some real numbers to it. And in doing so, there's an opportunity to say, if, if developers need some flexibility in terms of the amount that we're talking about, then the trade-off is the civic space you create must be public. So anyone can use it, you know, including non-residents, which I think is good since it's a way to encourage that kind of civic space, which I think is important in, in, um, in downtown URC and URB. Um, the final change is that, I believe this is in here, um, the intention was that this, this, this referred to land on buildable area. Um, yeah. I, think that's, I think that's expressed by this. So that a developer couldn't just say, "Well, here's a steep ledge, um, you know, that's your civic space." You can't do that. It has to be on a real buildable area. So that's right. explanation. Just a question about that comment here. So, um, so in this four, section four, um, so um, I'm looking at the unless the compelling. So is is the requirement for being open to the public in perpetuity only? Does that only exist if 
there, um, if there isn't an adherence to this, or is that in any event, in any case, in every, in every development? Case? No, you're correct that uh, the way it's written now is that kicks in if for whatever reason a developer wants to go under 10 square feet per unit. So it's and an it's, incentive, not a... But if it's 10 farm. square feet or more, then that requirement to open to the public doesn't exist. That is currently written, that's correct. Okay. So and I that's up for debate. Okay, I just want to yeah. understand how that's that is. Correct. Yes. And then it was, I'm just going to add um, a buildable area here. That was one right, thing you. that you suggested that... Uh, I just want to quickly, um, the, the, what was introduced, this concept for sort of a pick list between energy, um, increased energy efficiency standards and affordable housing is in the introduced um, ordinance, but um, <coughs> Councilor O'Donnell suggested some modifications to that, so that's why the entire thing is sort of, is highlighted, because um, it's been, it's been um, there's a suggestion to modify that. Blew it up. I'm sorry. It's not pretty anymore. Um, the, so the changes, that, as you described earlier, uh, there were four options that a developer could choose to meet for standards, and two of them can be characterized as environmental. Two of them could be characterized as having to do with affordable housing, um, and they could meet any combination of them. So you could be, uh, you could have a certain PERS rating. Could be a green building council lead certified, um, or you could have a certain amount of, of affordable housing units as defined under the zoning chapter, or you could, or you could build a certain amount of small units, which we hope would be market rate affordable. Um, this amendment suggests grouping the environmental and the affordable housing and saying you can't. It's not just either. It's, we need both. So everything we build should have an environmental standard in this uh, special permit process. However, to satisfy the environmental standard and to satisfy the affordable housing standard, you may choose which, um, which way you want to do that. So for example, to meet the environmental standard, you can either have a certain first rating or you can be a, a lead builder. Either one will satisfy. But you must meet both an environmental and an affordable housing standard. That's what that is. And as you can see, um, the actually amount but you can't see, but this is a change. The amount of units previously specified for affordable housing, they used to be 15, and now it's become 10. Um, number of small units used to be 50, and now it's become 25. And you might be able to explain that, that necessity better, better than I can, but it's a trade-off in terms of making this practice. Right, so, um, you know, if, if we're, the, the idea is if, if you need to be both of these standards, um, it was a pretty high bar for the others, and without having sort of the, the, the ability to pick one of all four standards, um, now requiring both standards to be met, we dropped the affordability numbers and the square footage size down so it wouldn't be as onerous to, to meet. Yeah, and to circle back, if I, if I may, to again the form we had a week ago. One clear thing I heard was concerns about um, standards, stringent standards that uh, relate to the environment, among other among other standards. And so, this makes it stricter. So then, the last item um, would be a change not to this special permit criteria, but would have, would um, is proposed to address any building. Um, um, even from building, you know, one unit. So it goes back to, it would apply to those that just fall under site plan um, and not necessarily the ones for larger projects of seven or more units. Um, and we just added, um, Councilor O'Donnell just suggested adding this bottom line here, but we, I brought this all over because it would be new language that is not incorporated into uh, it's new language from the same table that you're, um, that was, um, is up for um, consideration in this um, 
ordinance, but it's a portion of the table that wasn't highlighted yet in here. So. Yeah, this is this is very simple. This was a very concrete suggestion that came out of the forum, which is um, I heard from several residents concerns about if you have a large parking lot, simply headlights shining through uh, the lot into your window while you're while you're trying to fall asleep watching city council meetings or, or something, you know, soporific like that. Um, and this simply says, well, as you can see, uh, it, it adds some specificity to the requirements about buffers. So driveways wider than 15 feet shall be visually buffered um, from the side lot lines through setbacks or screening to adequately prevent nuisances from headlights from cars. That's all this. And I ask that the, the, we find another word for nuisances because um, that's a, a rather, well, first it's a, it's a, a legal meaning and it's something more than just headlights shining in your windows. Some people might find that to be a legal nuisance and some might not. Okay. I think the idea here is just to prevent the lights from shining in the windows, whether or not it constitutes a nuisance. Okay. Maybe light pollution? Block. Block. To block, yeah, to block, to block. Um, so that is it on the on the ordinance and the um, proposed changes since it was introduced. Mm -hmm. right, but that's the first one. Right, so the same, they're, they're the same, they're identical, you just need to adopt it in both URB and URC. So any of the changes you, so this, it, um, I had URC and B that I was passing out, but it's the same language, you just need to do it in both tables, because now each district has its own table. Okay. Now, did that cover everything that came from your form? To this point? No, it didn't cover everything that came from the form, but... It, it's a beginning, but it covers the extent of my recommendation. Okay. Um, I, I realize they're the same thing applying to two different areas, but for the public, would you give URB and URC an example of each or so that people understand the two different areas? Um, so geographically, an example. So, um, well, there's, um, so urban residential C wraps around um, downtown to about um, up Elm Street, um, sort of in a ring to Kensington, um, and goes up around Hill Road, and um, includes Aldridge Street, and then crosses over King Street, and is on the east side of um, downtown, um, Market Street, Union Street, that area, um, and then come, wraps around the south um, on bordering Pleasant Street, Con Street. Um, Urban Residential B is sort of the next piece beyond that. It goes out South Street, There's goes out Bridge Street, and there's also um, much of Florence's Urban Residential B. So the, these standards are the same for both? Right. Okay. How about underlying lot sizes? Um, well, you still, the minimum standard for lot size applies. So even so if you you need 2500 square feet per unit um and and you can only you can't have um, a multi-family seven unit multi-family in urban residential b for example it's still one unit um, per 2500 square feet of lot size so you might not be able to get to any of these um you might not be able to build out because the standards may restrict the total number of units you can actually put on your property. so i guess it's just to kind of simplify if you had uh, two acres in C and two acres in B. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the same. I know there's a limit on units. In there's a, a limit on the type of unit, so it's going to be a different configuration. Mm -hmm. Could you just right. describe that for a minute, just so it's really clear to everybody what the what what the cap is? Because A's got a, B's got a lower cap than C. Right. right. So um, well, there's the height limit that would limit um, how tall a structure could be in urban residential B. And then also, you can only have three units within one building in urban residential B. So otherwise, you'd be limit. Then you'd be creating side-by-side -side units that then necessarily would probably eat up more land on the property because they're not, you know, going. You're not going up. You're going out in essence. And urban residential C is a more compact form. Potentially, you could yeah. also do townhouses. 
but you could go up higher. Mm -hmm. So, any more questions from anybody up here of Ms. Mish before we take public comment on what's been presented? Uh, just to yeah, clarify, I'm, I'm relatively new. Um, did most of this discussion um, begin with uh, the potential of the development at Fort Hill? Is that what I heard earlier today? Fort Hill Terrace, is that kind of what led to some of these changes? Or? Well, no, not necessarily. I mean, there were. Um, there was um, a concern that there weren't enough specific standards once you got, uh, there was more of a comfort level for allowance for units under seven, so up to six <coughs> units, and there was just a general concern about maybe wanting to attach some more specific standards. There certainly was, um, you know, in the background and for years, um, Smith College has talked to, at various times about, um, you know, selling off that piece. So I think that's sort of always floating around there, but it wasn't, I wouldn't say it's the only impetus. It just that. seems like some of this kind of seems to be worded and geared for the development of a multi-building, you know, site versus a one set of unit building. Well, it's true. There are very few large parcels left that are in town to be developed, but there are a there are a few, and some, and the Lyman Estate is probably the biggest, other than up at the State Hospital, which is a different zone. Um, so, but the zoning has to address both smaller parcels and whatever might happen on a right. place. So when you like talk about you know parks, and civic space, and sidewalk connectivity, and you know all that to me kind of strings of a larger development, and that you know, a single building or something like that where those things might be impossible to me. Well, if you have a, if you can imagine, if you have, you know, a, um, a 20,000 square foot lot, let me do my numbers, 30,000 square foot lot, let's just say, um, you might want to have, in order to create some of the um, building orientation to the street, you might divide that up where you have a front building and then a building behind and then, but you want to make sure that there's access from the street to that building behind, um, and that that's, there's safe movement from where the parking is located to the front. So it might be 12 units, it might be 10 units um, that are divided up that way, but you still want to make sure that um, because we're talking about more urban development and in the and surrounding, um, you know, essentially the urban core of Northampton, that you have that adequate access. And it could just be, you know, a five foot wide sidewalk going from the front of the street to the rear of the property to access that other building. Yeah, that sidewalks is less of a concern. I guess yeah. it's the parks and the space and that type of thing. So the other thing about the park issue is that, you know, I think probably the, um, we talked about this in the planning board context too, that we don't necessarily mean a park like Look Park. <clears throat> But I think that's generally, you know, what people think of, big parks or child's park or something like that. But it really could be, um, you know, a small um, area that has, you know, a fountain or um, some other kind of, I mean, you could call that a park too. We've got little pocket parks with um, a piece of playground equipment or something like that um, that um, could be much smaller. So it's, it's safe to say that we did a tremendous number of zoning changes, and those were in the works prior to Smith doing anything definitive with Lyman. It's just that's the place where these will have the greatest impact because it happens to be the biggest geographic area that's going to change in the foreseeable future. So it'll have its greatest impact over there. Right. And we don't know what foreseeable means either. No. But <laughs> It's our, it's our example where yeah. the most could be done with these changes. Okay. Yeah. I have one question for you, too. Um, and it, it, it's talking about, first of all, that a dead end roadways won't exceed 500 feet. Uh, and it goes on to say, must uh, include bicycle and pedestrian connections from the dead end to a street or park or civic space. So you might have a. Um, a um, a dead end street um, that's less than 500 feet, but you still want to create a connection. So if it's not a vehicular connection, at least maybe you can walk through to another block or walk through to the other side. So, so the what is the impact if, in fact, where it ends is surrounded by private property 
and, and easements can't be had or, you know, you, you abut totally other private property and no one's excited about offering access through. Well, there may be other ways to design it. So maybe you have an access part way down the dead end street. Like, so it does, it's across. The, it doesn't but it sounded from it like it had to be at the dead end. It can be anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. It can be anywhere. Okay. Because I know that we in the we dealt with um, an easement for a ferry pipe, and people were concerned that it would be traversed by people. When in fact right. it was written such, you would have to crawl through the pipe to right. use the easement, but it still caused <laughs> consternation. Can I ask a question? Please. Um, first of all, just David, your question to Carolyn, I think. Carolyn, it says pedestrian connection. Uh, let's see. Uh, it says from the dead end to a street. It doesn't say halfway to the dead end. So I think David's question is a good one. Says from the dead end. My reading of that is they're designing that street so they don't take it all the way to the private property. They leave enough to get a pedestrian access at the end of that street. So this is a street that is not just taking in. Okay, but if it's going to service the end of the property, the dead end will have to go there. And as written, from that dead end, if has to provide access to other streets. I think if you just added from the dead end street, yeah, and it, yeah. then, it would, then it wouldn't be so specific. Yeah, yeah. It would allow for all that. You know, and that was my own concern that if, if to if to lay the thing out and get maximum use and create maximum units, which is a desire, you have to go all the way through the property, but where it actually ends, there's no access because it's private property and yeah. no one wants to give you an easement yeah. for right. a bicycle path or a sidewalk. Right. So okay. we can. I have another question. Can I, please. Um, Carolyn, can you explain the thought behind this last sentence that was added in part in paragraph one? Projects shall not be visually or physically insulated from the adjacent street. So. If I understand what this is saying, if there are trees on the street, the developer should cut down the trees and build a building on the street? Um, I thought the idea was that there no. should be the opposite. That I, I mean, I, my interpretation, of, and maybe it's, maybe it's the wrong, um, maybe the language needs to be adjusted. Um, but I think the idea is you're not creating a screen, a, a screen or a barrier. So if it's not, if you have, you know, shade trees along the street front, that you should cut them down. But more that if you're, you don't want to put up a stockade fence or you don't want to put up, um, you know, a or something like that between and the street and a building. Can I make a suggestion? Well, we've got the public health here, and we'll we'll be discussing this after we have public comment. And so I think we, we'll we take all those questions and discuss them. But I think it might be uh, a good idea to hear So we're good. We'll start taking public comment. And if you could just, because we're being videoed, identify yourself even if we know who you are so that it's on record on the video. And then please make your comments. So Adam, you're in front. We'll start off with you. I'm, I'm Adam Fuller from the Rock Street. I like to see that this is moving in the direction of some increased protections for others of these larger projects. And I'd like to voice a couple suggestions from other cities which have dealt with infill. Um, one is from uh, Toronto Urban Design Guidelines for infill townhouses. And they start with have front entrances on existing and newly created public streets. And they go on to say <coughs> they want to avoid back to front facing relationships such as front doors facing rear yards or service areas. That's a situation where I think the abutter starts to feel the development is really intruding on their privacy. People looking in at you, playing in your backyard, sunbathing, pool, whatever. Um, and then another piece comes from Knoxville, where they say, when a house is built on a slab with a low pitch next to a traditional older house, the portions of the two houses clash, resulting in an absence of architectural harmony. So there's two specific, specific conditions which um, I hope make their way into here. Thanks. Please. Yes, my name is Francisco Palomo. Um, I'm looking forward to Phillips Place. 
Actually, for, I don't have so much to comment. I have a question. All right. At the beginning of your presentation, you, made, you indicated there is an additional change in which uh, if a property is being um, built, added to a lot where there's already an existing structure, there's going to be a special review process. Could you explain what that means? All right. I didn't understand. So there are two so pieces. Of, so there's a, um, the planning board reviews. Um, projects under what we call site plan review, which is more of a technical standards, the uses are allowed, but the board wants to ensure that it fits all these standards that have been previously um, adopted relative to the, um, and it's residential units, it's not, you know, an accessory structure, garage, etc. It would just be if you're adding a new residential unit. Special permit is another kind of review, which is the bulk of this public hearing has been about, about these standards. In which case, the planning board had um, reviews a project to determine whether it's appropriate in that specific location. I'm not following, Clark. Let's just take a situation where there is a lot. Uh -huh. and there is a house on it, and but there is a, a lot of open space, and somebody decides they are going to build a new, uh, you know, residential unit on that lot where there is already a house. All right. Could you explain what? The, right. The so, would be. Thank you. Um, sure. So we, there are probably two ways that someone could uh, deal with that. They could, if the lot has enough frontage, you could potentially create a separate building lot, and then create a separate single-family house on its own distinct lot, and that wouldn't trigger site plan review. Um, but if you wanted to build a structure on an existing lot that had a residential unit in it, and it was detached. Currently, it requires either as an accessory apartment, um, a zoning board special permit, or this standard would require site plan approval. It's still allowed because under the zoning that was adopted in September, um, the uh, council adopted um, provisions for allowing m more than one residential structure on a parcel. So site plan approval means that and basically, you just submit a plan and it would be approved automatically so long as it meets standards, or would it be... The planning board will review it, and it's a use allowed by right. Yes. I think Attorney Seen will also be put on this one, too. I, I just want to explain that a special permit is a discretionary permit. The I understand planning that. board would get to decide whether it's an appropriate situation. The site plan uh, is not discretionary. It's almost impossible. There's very few instances where it can be denied. It's just a, a, a review to make sure it, it forms with technical requirements and it can be tweaked by the planning board but not denied. Thank you. I just want, so what you're talking about a change it would be a site plan or rule and not be a special permit. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, next question or comment. Please. Hello. My name is Jim Nash. I live at 18 Montfield. Um, uh, first I'd like to say that I'm pleased with uh, many of the, the changes. Um, I'm also really confused by them. I, I haven't had a chance to review them. This is, this is a lot of technical language. I think for members of the planning board, this is the first time they've seen them. I think that, you know, the, this, this process is feeling a little nutty to me right now. Um, that to have this much detail coming in at the last minute. In fact, part of what I wanted to comment on was on the, the ordinance as it was coming forward tonight had so little detail, particularly around streets. Um, so therefore, seeing all of this information tonight, I, I, I actually find um, that's good. Um, but um, the, the, a critical piece that I see is missing is the tie between streets and the roadways and the density that we're allowing to be developed. There needs to be a relationship between the two. If somebody's putting in a house, God bless you, put in a driveway. If somebody's putting in 18 units of housing, you gotta put in a road. That, that needs to be clarified. Um, roadways of 500 feet. I, you know, is that a driveway of 500 feet going to you know, 10 units? Or is it you know, only 50 feet long and it goes to 10 units? These things need to be factored in and figured out. And that, um, and developers, you know, like, like the park space idea, I, I really like that. This is the kind of stuff they look at. Square footage, oh, I gotta make a little park. I got so many acres, so many units, they can figure it out. They need these types of details around the roadways. Um, 
And one of the things that I'm going to request around um, any roadways that are uh, uh, regs that are proposed is that they go to DPW. That our experts on roadways and how they're built and constructed, they did a great job on, on North Street. Let's, let's send it over to our experts and have them review things. Um, a, um, and I think I saw this in here, so there's going to be a few things I might be repeating. Um, I um, would like to see that um, townhouses, when they are built, that they are on a street, that they're not on a parking lot, that they're not on a driveway, that there's actually a street there. Townhouses look great. You go around town, you can drive by townhouses, you say, that one looks great, that one doesn't look right. It's because the ones that look good are on streets, and the ones that look goofy are on parking lots. Um, an idea that, since we're throwing in lots of stuff here, is the idea of flag lots for single-family homes. One of the issues down in my neighborhood is that we have very long, deep lots, and that people are trying to figure out how to develop these in a way that they make sense for the neighborhood. Right now, we're, many of those Henry Street properties, they're looking like they're going to get attached structures going deep into the lot. That's the only real alternative they have because of the frontage, um, where you need 50 feet of frontage just to put in one unit. So the, the value is to have units that railroad into the property. If we considered having flag lots off of, off of driveways, people could sell those properties with the idea that maybe some single-family homes could go in. I'm throwing that idea out there. Um, the, the bigger issue for me in all of this is people continue to be surprised by the new zone. And, that, um, and there's reason for it. Um, last, um, you know, during the zoning process, people were provided this, all right? This is a map of Northampton and produced by the planning department saying that this is how infill will look if we approve this zoning. On, not on this map is the Lyman Estate, which was discussed for years. Um, my neighborhood, Montview, uh, Henry Street, uh, Phillips Place is not on there. And that um, what we're seeing is that the information we went forward with around the zoning was not in match up. And the reason this is important is that when people stand up and they say, I didn't know this was going to happen, I don't like this, it's because we can't call them NIMBYs because we didn't give them the right information to start out with. We didn't, you know, Ward 3 Neighborhood Association asked that letters be sent with the new zoning to all of the property owners within these zones. That didn't happen. Um, this information, I, you know, when somebody from Phillips Place said to me, I'm surprised about this, and I could say, I know, it's not on here. Lyman Estate, they're surprised. It's not on here. And it's going to keep going. Because one of the things that happened, and I, the counselors who are in URB, you need to listen, that URC and URB are pretty much the same. And that the issues that I'm talking about for my neighborhood, they're going out, Prospect, they're going out to Florence, they're going to go on Franklin Street. And I, I like the idea of this site plan, but still, what we've approved is not what people are expecting. So my vote would be to uh, continue the moratorium, get more of these details out in a way where people can actually sit down and read them. I, I, I can't imagine approving this tonight without going home and reading it and, um, and slow the process down. I'm comfortable with the moratorium being extended. Um, so, thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, next comment, please. Yeah. Um, my name is Jane Potter, and I live on Phillips Place, and I wanted to um, 
thank you for your diligence on trying to get this done. It's, uh, I know you've had many, many meetings. Um, I, too, would like to suggest that we have a moratorium on this for now. Um, I've done a little bit of case study work myself, um, which I found really interesting, both in all the small cities and counties in Oregon and a, a most recent one, the city of Alexandria, Virginia. Um, and I think something that we want to think about as we talk about more units of housing are the fact that housing requires more services. And what I found especially thoughtful about the um, case studies that I've brought here is that in these kinds of meetings, when they were trying to come up with zoning proposals in these instances, they invited the parking clerk, um, the DPW, the police, the fire. Um, people really care about these issues. And I think when we're talking about adding more cars, more parking in, in tricky areas, uh, Pomeroy Terrace, the Shaw's property, potentially the Polish church at the end of Phillips. There's some issues that, that some of you on the planning board just may not be as familiar with as those of us who live there. Um, and so I would suggest that it might be uh, a more thoughtful process to involve more city departments and to have a neighborhood oversight committee um, for some of these just to work with you on issues that we may not know about. I know when we had the Pleasant Street meeting, there were a couple of people who pointed out that, oh, you can't have a crossing there. That's really a blind corner. We watch accidents happen there all the time. These are the kinds of things that I think we need to pay attention to because this is a really important piece of ordinance. Um, we want to get it right. This is a legacy for future people who live in Northampton. And I think sitting here tonight talking about lighting and dead ends and adding language at the last minute, um, these are all important things, and I, and I applaud them. But I think we need more time to be able to do this thoughtfully and carefully. I also am very impressed with both of these case studies in all of Oregon, where written letters went out to every single person to let them know what was going on. Um, I mean, ideally, all the neighbors would come to these meetings, but they don't. And when we've gone around in our area between Montview and Phillips, um, a couple of us did some research to find that 30 properties, for instance, uh, fall under the small unit, meaning that they only require site approval and have no neighborhood oversight whatsoever. Four of them are on Phillips Place alone, which is destined to be part of an historic district. So the capacity for neighborhood change is really huge. And I would suggest that the neighbors, both in, in all the wards, you know, for whom this has an effect or for anyone who'd like to participate, a lot more neighborhood oversight um, with neighborhood planning committees it is really an important thing to consider. I myself would be happy to, to work with you on this. I think there's a danger in doing something too quickly that's going to have a lot of um, effects that we may not be completely aware of. I'd, I'd like to suggest that there definitely be a moratorium on the smaller number of units and the ability to have a neighborhood oversight committee on those versus just site planning, which sounds like everything is accepted and the neighbors don't need to know what's happening, um, despite the fact that there could be four seven-unit properties arising on their street. And in terms of large unit development, which again is a great idea, it's hard for me to understand that there could be a one-size-fits-all. Now, certainly we need standards, but the Lyman property, if neighbors and people decided that it might be a good idea, why couldn't that be a, a supreme green hotel and spa, a destination to Northampton kind of place, if neighbors in that area wanted it? Whereby we're not putting more um, tax, we're not taxing our infrastructure. We're not adding you know, two cars per unit. We're not adding to the bad quality of our air. We're not adding more pupils to the schools, thereby needing an override every year. I mean, if there are creative ways to think about if we can be an advocate for development, how these different properties can be used. Thank you. Uh, additional comments? More folks? Please. I don't know about that hotel proposal, but I'm <laughs> Claudia Lefko. I live in Ward 3. And to answer your question, I think that on some level, this conversation started in our neighborhood, where most of us are coming from, Jim Nash, and Jane and um, the others who have spoken, when there was a piece of property, four acres, that the Aquadros owned on Montview Avenue. And when this went up for sale, it's right downtown, and it was the possibility that this could be developed, and it was tried, they tried to develop it. 
a number of people, somebody bought the property, then they tried to develop it. The neighbors were very involved, only from the outside, basically, looking at what the proposals were. They couldn't come up with something that neighbors wouldn't fight against. They sold it to somebody else. Those people tried to develop it. Again, the neighbors stepped in. At that point, I think the city mandated that that group meet with us. We again could not agree. It was sold again. So over and over since 2000, when the property was put up for sale and bought, our neighborhood has been vigilant about um, what could happen downtown. I'm here as a weary person, I'll tell you, because from 2000 and now we're in 2014, I feel like our neighborhood in particular and the bigger ward has been coming to meetings and trying to advocate for, you know, as Jane said, you know, neighborhood oversight and, and appropriate development for many, many years. And honestly, and I mean, and Jim, he's been on all these committees and he actually knows the details of all this and can comment. I can't do that. I'm just telling you in the broad sense, as somebody who's been to, I can't even count how many meetings in 14 years about this, it still doesn't feel satisfying. It still feels like we're sort of um, voices you know, in the wilderness screaming about this. So I am basically here to say, please don't vote on this tonight. Please extend the moratorium. I hope you will send a letter to everyone in the city about the zoning. I mean, I know zoning is a deathly issue until it appears across the street from you, and then you have to be a quick fix on it. So, so you know, it's not for lack of interest from the public that, that even, I mean, there, there are a few people here tonight, but I think people have wanted to be involved, but we haven't seen, um, seen the avenue kind of the way open up for us. Uh, and just like another response to just listening again to this tonight, to this afternoon. You know, we're talking about city standards and nice sidewalks and good roads. But if you drive down into my neighborhood, everyone I hope on the planning board should take a little tour down Montview Avenue to Henry Street and see the long lots and look at the sidewalks and the crumbling streets down there. Because if somebody on Henry Street puts up a nice development with nice sidewalks and so forth, it will not conform to the neighborhood standards. <laughs> and so I would just like to say that one approach for the city is to let's create standards in the city. Like let's fix the streets and fix the sidewalks and put this on a back burner and see if we can't like bring the whole city up to some standard and then invite people to come and meet the standard. Thank you. Uh, additional comment? Anyone else? Please. Oh, we got two here. Oh, oh sir. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Longer than mine. No, go ahead. Uh, Fred Zimnock, Ward 3. I was listening to the comments. I never expect to see so much detail. And uh, really, I can't take it all in. I don't know how to make uh, comments on everything, especially I can't read the screen. I don't have a handout. Uh, so moratorium on this, I think, is appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Uh, Joseph Cadet, Ward 4. Uh, I, I heard it mentioned before the meeting that uh, most people get glossy-eyed and glazed over when they hear about zoning revisions. I can see that most of you have that look now. And I've got good news and bad news. The bad news is I can talk more than everyone here. <laughs> the good news is I'm not going to because they basically said most of what I would like to say. And look, I know you folks have worked on this a long, long time. And I, I, applaud, I appreciate that. I, I mean that sincerely. It's not to patronize. It's, it was clear by the questions that you folks even were asking uh, Carolyn by some of these, about some of these, that those questions belied the fact that I don't even think you folks are fully there. And there's no question we need more time. And, you know, you folks are the folks we hired and, and, and elected to do this. You are the experts in these areas. But we also need to know, as laymen, what everything, what it, what it means to us, and I, I, I really appreciate Ms. Potter's comment about the legacy that this leaves. This is it. Once this is it, it's a done deal, and we have to live with the consequences. And we don't know enough. And, and most of the people here are really educated, and they're the involved people, and we still are partly clueless. And some of you aren't, still have questions. You're clued in, but you still have many questions. 
we need to extend this moratorium because we need more time. We need more time for everybody to understand this. And I, I appreciate, uh, uh, Councillor, the, uh, the question that you brought up about the developers within a certain specified size of the lot, they did not have to allow public access, Ms. Carney. Uh, and that one just threw me back. Don't you realize, any developer worth their salt, I lived in a major city where, on an island where land is a commodity, and developers will do whatever they need to do because profit is the bottom line. And if they're gonna pay $10 million for the Ward 3 property up in Fort Hill, they're going to make a profit, and we're going to be looking at a lot of units, and they're going to make sure if they don't need or want public access, all they got to do is do whatever standards they need. They need to be the standards need to be so that the developers have to adhere to safeguards that really do apply on a practical level to us, the citizens that live here. And I implore you, folks, please consider extending the moratorium until. Every, I know this has been a long process, and I do applaud that, but it's clearly we're not there. And if you do this tonight, you're basically saying, we've been doing this long enough, we've got the answers, and your questions or your concerns are not as important as we feel they are. And I don't mean that to be disrespectful, but it just feels very clear we're just not there. And I thank you for that time. Any more comment? Please. Uh, question? I'm right up. Yeah. And tell us who you are, please. Oh, oh yeah. My name is Richard Wagner. I live at 48 Lyman, so the Lyman estate is directly behind me, just for context for everything. Um, a question in court, because I think this is a situation where um, be careful what I wished for. Um, uh, so about the 10 square feet per unit, how, how did you come to that number? Is that like a generally accepted? No. Or, I mean, I'm just trying, because I, I came late to the stands. I'm a reasonably smart guy. This is confusing to you, I <laughs> Just, just, it is. Um, I, I thought I understood it, and now I understand it less, listening here. Um, but so, per unit, it's 10 square feet, which is two desks, maybe? Three? I mean, really, that's sort of what we're talking about. So is, is that a standard, or where did that come from? Well, the idea, initially, there was no number, so no, people were no. concerned about the mm -hmm. minimum. And the reason why I think it came out of planning board as a recommendation without a number is that there are many ways to create um, valuable pocket parks or features, sculpture, art, fountains, etc., that are not big. And in the urban context, you could have a beautiful yeah. sort of small area, but it really draws your attention and it's a high value space. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how big it is. I mean, you know, compared to a thousand square feet of just lawn, yeah. you know, you, it could be um, um, exponentially just more valuable. As, and so, but hearing the fact that there need to be a number, we know that the baseline is obviously seven units, so the minimum would be 70 square feet, and maybe in that context you could create, you know, a beautiful urban kind of um, feature that yeah. would be valuable. So it wasn't picked, I mean, the number is to make sure that it wasn't too big and cut out, you know, something that could be smaller but much more valuable, um, but to have a number nevertheless. Can I, yeah. can I answer also? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I wrote kind of a, a competing version and that was originally a percentage, actually, of buildable lot. Yeah, well, and this so, is like four tenths of a percent. Me? Four tenths of a percent, I think. Yeah, I mean, the, the number is not magic. Um, yeah. So, but that's to say that it was just kind of a, a creative process that, yeah. you know, and that's what we've, we've wound up with. It's yeah. not, it's not, no. I don't think anyone would try and convince you that it must, <coughs> it must be ten. Certainly I would. Yeah, no, I was yeah, just wondering about that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks for your help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Additional comment? Let me just add oh, 15 seconds, I promise. About the, you talked about the park, and, you know, I know CPA's money, uh, that's a different subject, and it goes for a lot of things, but part of that parcel 
up in the Fort Hill area should be a parcel that is, if not through CPA money, some other way should be a legitimate park. And even if it's the size of Semensky Park over here, as we dubbed it in the 70s when they put in all the sidewalks, you know, <laughs> we need something substantial and legitimate in the city center, regardless of all this land that we're saving on the outskirts of this town and, and all the density that we think we can create here and make money for the city. We need another parcel of land that's a legitimate piece of open space and not just a few benches or, as you've addressed, Carolyn, but something more substantial. Uh, any other comment before we start chatting about it again? All right, well, we're not closing the public hearing, so we can come back and get additional comment. But any feedback from anyone here on what, what we've heard? And, well, I guess my question, I have a number of reservations about the proposed ordinance. Um, I, I don't know whether I should quickly run through them now or what we're going to do if we're going to. I mean, what Please do. Let me preface that just by saying that uh, Alan and several other people here are recent members of the planning board, and a lot of this ordinance happened before they were here. So in Alan's case, he's reacting to this. It, it's the first time he's been through this. Many of us on order of planning board did it in the fall for the original changes. And some, but some of the planning board members have not done that before. So for some of them, they're it's sort of in the same position. The public is just kept, he's getting up to speed on this. So please. Yeah, ignorance is worse. Yeah. Oh. Until it goes across from your house. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, just, I'll just quickly go through the things uh, that bother me. Um, for, um, I asked the question about that in paragraph one, projects shall not digitally or physically be insulated from adjacent streets, seems to accomplish the opposite of what I would have thought would be the objective. Um, unless, I mean, I understand what Carolyn said, not stockade fences or something. That's not what it says, that's presently drafted. This would require that the developer cut down trees in order to present a building to the street. Uh, so that it wouldn't be insulated from adjacent streets. Going on, the I, I let's see, the, the paragraph four, the park or civic space. I since the language as drafted says it has to be desirable for residents of the project. It's not clear to me. I can't understand why city's ordinance, city zoning ordinance should require that residents that buy or rent into a development have to be happy. Um, why is it our job to protect the people that voluntarily choose to live there? Since it's only the, the standards are to make it accessible, available, desirable, desirable for residents of the project. Um, I don't know what a park or civic space is. I'm afraid that is so vague that it, it could end up being it's just not fair to a developer to have a standard that's so vague. I think the 10 square feet per unit is totally too small to accomplish anything. I mean, a 10 unit development would be a part less than the size of what's in front of us here is. I mean, I, if, it's going to, if there's a point in having that requirement there, I think it should be bigger. Um, then the standard paragraph 8, um, I. I have reservations about having a requirement for home energy standards. <clears throat> um, I think it's great to have high energy standards, but to impose it as a part of zoning, which to me, to my mind and understanding, has to do with structures and density and, and uh, uh, location relative to other structures, I don't know why. It, well, I don't know why that's part of the zoning ordinance, or what is proposed to be. And we also have to be aware that that is very often incompatible with making it affordable. Um, I mean, the units in the Hospital Hill are extremely energy efficient, and if you have four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, you can buy one. Uh, so it's not. I'm uncomfortable with even having those requirements in there. And I'll quit there. Other uh, 
Vice President Condon, please. Yeah, I'd like to pursue the comment about energy efficiency, though. I mean, when we're talking about providing city infrastructure for new development, I want to, I want to not miss an opportunity to try to make those units self-sustainable as far as the energy grid is. So it makes sense to me that we're asking for that because, because of the infrastructure. In the same way that we would send the um, stormwater management plan to DPW, and, and DPW does review pieces of all of the projects that we get. So they are the planning board's experts that give us a written assessment about stormwater management. And you know, in this case, I think that, in my mind, that's where that was coming from, was more about the city's infrastructure and what we could do to not uh, promote development that we couldn't support. Other, other comment? Please. Um, I have been part of this process, so I'm a little bit in a, in a spot. Um, and I'm comfortable how we got here. Uh, I will agree with Alan, though. Um, I do think um, the, the sentence there on number one about projects that be visually busy, it just, I don't know, it seems, uh, I'm not sure what it's saying, whether they should or should not. It, if there are trees there, would you have to cut them down? If there weren't trees next door, would you have to, you know, that does seem a little bit. And the only other uh, comment I would make is that um, I, I do think, and, and I know we talked about this when it first came up and, and uh, we've gone round and round about it, you know, imposing that, that some developer has to build some kind of public space, you know, who's going to take care of that public space, you know, who's responsible for that public space, what if th bad things happen in that public space. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't know what the overall feeling is, but um, uh, I would just as soon see that uh, it, uh, it not enough to, to vote against the entire thing, but if number four was eliminated, that would not bother me in the least. <laughs> it just seems like it, it's just asking for something that is is uh, it, it's not fair to ask a, a developer when they're not going to be responsible for it once they turn over the project. They've created the space, and it just seems to create more questions than answers. So, that's just my honest. I, I just want to be clear about the, this space and it. And it uh, I don't want to interject too much, uh, but as a legal matter, uh, these are not public spaces. These are private spaces. These are private, and, and I know it's confusing because we're calling them parks and civic spaces. They're not parks, and they're not civic spaces. They're private spaces. And what's proposed is if a developer wants to uh, reduce the square footage from 10 square feet per unit, I don't know how you do that, uh, it's almost going to disappear. But uh, uh, if they want to reduce the size, then the trade-off for reducing the size is allowing public access. But I want to be very clear that the planning board has very limited ability to require a private developer in exchange for a discretionary permit to give a public easement part of its property. The Supreme Court has been pretty clear on this in recent years, so I want to be really clear that this is private space, whether we, even though we're calling it a civic space or a park, it's not. But it, but it, but it is, it is public space for that developer. For that developer. So yeah, if there's 10 space. units or 12 units or whatever, it's common space for the occupants of right. that development. But when we think of the concept of park or civic space, right. we think of public places right. okay. like Pulaski Park. Okay. And it's not. Common space is probably a better right. yeah. example, yeah. like you have, have with condominiums or something, where it's Correct. accessible to all of the owners, right. but not to outside of the question. Yes, for, for this listener, um, could something be common private space, but yet open and available to the public? No. Not at all. No, not in exchange for the grant of a discretionary permit. This is private property. Other uh, comments? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And uh, I want to remind everybody, there's two entities here, the Planning Board and, and the Ordinance Committee. But I, I did want to make a, a couple of comments. First of all, that these public hearings are working sessions. The committee sort of deal with issues and then at a certain point in the process we bring them out and we say come on down folks and take a look at what we've been doing and give us your input and tell us how close are we and in this instance I think we're getting there but we're not close enough for anything action wise so I'm hoping that my the ordinance committee our group continues as a public hearing to its next session um, part of that is that so many changes have been made to the documents since 
it got printed, then I think we, at the very least, before we take any action, got to have to get everything incorporated we've talked about into a final version of the document. And I think some good, good comments were made by the public. I mean, Mr. Nash alone has oracle status on this. He was on the zoning revisions committee that got us started down this road in the first place. So I, I very much value his comment. And, and the other thing is, this was the most difficult part of the changes we made in the fall, which is why we sort of gave it seven months to finish it. And I don't want the fact that this thing says we have to be done by July to mean that we have to, to not finish it properly. I'd be much more comfortable, um, particularly in light of the fact that the city council is coming into budget season. That occupies pretty much June for us. Then people are going on vacation over the summer, so they don't always have access. So rather than rush this to get done by the end of June when we're really busy on other things, I'd be very comfortable with somebody proposing extending the moratorium, moratorium, say, through the end of the year. I think we can finish it up, you know, by September, October. I just don't want to do it during budget season, and I don't want to do it July and August when people just aren't around and paying attention. But I think we're, we're getting there, and I don't want to discount the staff work or the planning board work on this. I think we're, we really are getting a little bit focused, but I think there's still work to be done. So, you know, that's just my personal opinion. We're, we're getting there, but I don't want to rush it for this this sort of arbitrary July deadline. Thank you. Um, and I do want to get 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 it perfected because really zoning, and we, we made the biggest changes in the fall that we've made since the zoning ordinance got created in the mid 70s. And it's like the DNA of the city. And, and I just I just assume metal with it, with our DNA with clean hands the very least. So I, I don't mind giving it a little more time, but I, co I commend everybody that's been working on it because I think it's coming into focus. But I'd rather take another five months maybe and get it really, really right so we're comfortable with it. That's just my comment. I, I think, I, I mean, I think we need to discuss it because this has come up in the audience. Um, I do think we need to uh, get the opinion of the planning department, though. So I, I'd ask Wayne Clyden. Yes, but just procedurally, if you want to do, I'm, I'm, I have no objection to a moratorium. If you want to do a moratorium, it's a zoning ordinance like anything else. So it has to be introduced to city council, yeah. refer it after public hearing. So my suggestion, if you want to do that, do it right. is to make a motion now so we can introduce it next week and start the process. Yeah, and any, any one of us can start the process and sponsor it. So. Well, I mean, I, I would make a motion that we consider a moratorium. With a, you, you should do it with a date specific. Well, I mean, so I mean, my, my motion is that we extend the moratorium um, to to the end of the year, but <coughs> I would like to discuss it. Before. Does that preclude finishing it in September, October? Or just sort of no. Okay, if in the moratorium exists, it just means that. We have until then to do it, but it doesn't stop us from acting before then. Right. So basically, this, as this is proposed, um, replaces the moratorium language. So anytime you make a zoning amendment, you'd be amending the moratorium and you know trading, swapping out. What you don't, what you want to do is make sure you voted on any moratorium before, before. it ended, because yeah. then you know you don't have a gap. Yeah. Um, and, th and that's something that, that that kind of falls in the three of us. But if, if well, that. that is, it's going to get started. Anyway. Yes. Well, we're, we're mid-session, so oh. at the end of the session. But at the same time, I, we don't want to have that gap there. So if we're going to, essentially, I think if we continue our public hearing to our first meeting in June, it's not going to make it. <laughs> so we're going to need those ex that extra time. And I don't know about the rest of you, but June is totally consumed with budget. And then I don't like doing substantial things in July and August because so many of the public members are, you know, off playing mini golf somewhere and are not around to pay attention. So, um, so I'll second the motion. Well, it's a motion. That it, no, it actually, it's it, 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 it was but right, but a question on my own. I don't know if it needs to come from us or you want right. to file it as. My my, my question is, oh. is the motion to consider now? Just laying it on the table temporarily, and then we introduce well, a new. For this is just just for ordinance, but I'd certainly be comfortable if we continued our public hearing to our June meeting and give planning time to 
perfect the document, incorporate all the changes that aren't in writing but are up here. Uh, the planning board, I think, I mean, if, if we're going to continue, they can continue. You can do the same thing. Yeah. But uh, there, there's two things here, I think. We continue the public hearing. That's e the easy thing for us to do. And we won't, we won't decide on it until we close the public hearing. But there's also the question of extending the moratorium, which to do that by the end of June, for, uh, for the council within process, we need to start right away because that's going to that's gonna take some time to do. And we've got, you know, half of this month and next month to deal with it. So that we'd have to file, right? That we'd have to continue is easy, but we'd have to get right on that extension of the moratorium. Are, are there projects in the hopper that this is holding up? This moratorium? Or? Um, you know, we know of one, um, I, I think the one that we, um, Shaw's is certainly there, the prospective buyer has been waiting to see the outcome of, of um, the new standard. That's the only one I can think of. Yeah. And I'm assuming it helps you with the ordinance committee sponsors this request. Yeah. Because uh, then it probably doesn't have to come back to us. You still have to hold a public hearing. Yeah, we still have to hold a public hearing on it. But we'll do that in June. In June. Yeah. We can do that in June. Have another June. And, and then would we have ultimately have another one at some point? Or or that would be June would probably be the end of it as far as a joint? Um maybe yes, maybe no. Depends, <laughs> on, depends on what we depends on what we do. But I think if we don't if we don't do that tonight, we're not gonna make it. And I'm really, and I really would like to continue right. this so we can keep working on it. So I, I think that's the consensus. So I, I withdraw the motion I made about more torn for now, and the first motion I make is we continue it to Sorry. our public hearing continue. in June. All right. So Sorry. ordinance would not close its public hearing. It would continue it at our June meeting, which is June the ninth or twelfth or so. A time and place, sir. Here. I think it's the night. June 9th. Time? And uh, 530 work. Now that's just for ordinance. I mean, we can make it a joint one if you're all available, if you want to try to schedule. Do you want to continue? Does the planning board want to continue their public hearing till then, or till your well, next there's meeting? There's no reason not to. If, if the ordinance does, we need right. to match that. Yeah, we need to be. Right, and your May, your next possible hearing date anyway is May 22nd, and you've got a pretty full agenda for that. So it probably yeah. makes sense. So are you guys all available June 9th, or we could have some other kind of, you know configuration as well? Oh. And you have a new you have a new member too that we will be on by then. Right, and we have a couple other members who couldn't make it tonight. So. So June 9th at 5 30? So well, if we haven't yeah. voted on it yet, but all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And now we should do the moratorium. Yep. So, so that, that that will come up then, because that's going to be it's zoning if it changes the. So, so from, from ordinance, do you want to sponsor an extension of the moratorium until the end of. Yeah, I, I, I believe we, we do just that. Okay. So we spot, sponsor an extension. Sponsor an extension, and, and then we just have it say January 1st, 2015. January 1st or December 31st? Does it matter if you ain't? I mean, doesn't. I think we're going to be done before then anyway. Yeah. Does anyone want a holiday? Do you want to celebrate yeah. New Year's? <laughs> <laughs> So 31st, because the other is a holiday. Yeah, exactly six months. Oh, oh no, so you want the 31st? Huh? The 31st, yeah. Okay. Are you comfortable with that second? Yes. Second. Okay, all in favor of that one? Aye. 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 Now, I need an official vote for the planning board to continue its hearing to do now. So moved. All in favor? You don't need to. Right. No. Yeah, that's what I was. I, 
So no, they're just voting to sponsor a change, so you don't need to. Okay, that's what I'm Though it's zoning, so you may see it at your next meeting on the 22nd, but it's not going to take a lot of your time, right? You should be able to. No, it won't go to the 22nd because it has to be advertised for oh, two weeks. Okay. So it can't go until June That's right. for advertising. Okay. So you might need to do it in two readings, actually, in June. Yeah. Okay. Um, any, any, anything else for either? Do you have anything else for yourselves? Anything for planning board before we're done? And anything less on ordinance, we continue. We finish the rest of our agenda before we start the public hearing. Oh, can I go on second? Yeah. Adam? Yeah. Um, if I can make a suggestion about how best to use the time in this meeting, the next one. Um, I think we'd really benefit to have some illustrations about a bunch of these concepts, like what is not separated from adjacent street, things like that, so that the public and the board members can work concretely. Okay, it means this, it doesn't mean that. <coughs> And we have, we do have one more to do. We're not done yet. Because we have a sign to talk about. Signs. Remember? Signs permitted any district URB. Thank you, folks, very much. Okay. It just means you're going to come back and see us again sometime real soon. Yes, we are. Just, it depends on what Carolyn's got. I don't, don't think we need you for the signs, but. Uh, <laughs> just to know, just. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I think we're going to take the plates on top and we're going to work. Yeah. 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 Vertical. Yeah. Um, Carolyn, can you think of any reason why Attorney Sewell needs to be around for signs? Do you like signs? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> you can make your getaway. Thank you for being here, though. You're going to talk to for the signs. Signs. Mm -hmm. So, Carolyn, you want to present? Yeah, so um, I'll just. I don't have a PowerPoint for that because it's really exciting. <laughs> um, but the idea is we've always had um, allowance for blade signs, meaning hanging over the sidewalk or projecting out from the front facade of the wall. And, um, but they've only been allowed to be 12 inches and less triggering a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals. And so we've sent a lot of people downtown to ZBA, and we just felt like um, Maybe we should allow those in addition to the standard wall sign and also allow them to be a bit bigger. And so that's what those, we, we did some, um, actually Wayne did most of the research on this one about size. We played around with this square footage to the planning board actually was many months ago and they came back to the planning board. But um, we based it on sort of what other cities have done and, but they're, they still, people can still opt to go to the zoning board if they want bigger than this in, increased size. Um, but it also allows you to do it by right. So if you want both a wall sign and a blade sign, that's all it does. I just had one thing to think of. So this is obviously partially about being more permissive for things that aren't negative. But actually looking at communities who are doing this, a lot of communities are doing because they really want to encourage the blade signs. It's not just about being permissive for stores, it's you know, creating a more vibrant environments for pedestrians. Because you think signs on buildings are really focused out in the street or across the street. Blade signs really focused on people who are walking the street to see it. All right, and this does affect all the zoning districts? Just commercial. Commercial? Districts. Yeah, we don't allow them in residential districts. So just yeah, business. Right. Any yeah, of the. Business. And, okay. And by B, you mean business? Right. Okay. And I can't remember, is there a limit to how many any given establishment can have? One. One. Right. But there can be more than one on a building because there can be more than one establishment. Right. And you could also go to the zoning board if you felt like you had a compelling reason to have more than one blade sign for your establishment. The zoning board then could weigh that. Does that make sense? Or bigger if you wanted a bigger one. Why do you think businesses on the second floor shouldn't be able to have a blade sign? Well, if we're talking about more pedestrian activity and pedestrian focus, um, it's much harder to see blade signs when you're a pedestrian, but it adds to, obviously, the, you know, if you're well, driving and you're far away, you can see it. But A second floor business could have a blade sign at a first floor level, with an arrow pointing up, or whatever they wanted to do. Right, and you can also have signs on the door that enter, that goes up, which has been used for the most part, and you can also have a wall sign. So many times second floor businesses have their signs on the access door to the second floor. Yeah, 
not clear to me why they shouldn't be able to have the same kind of sign as the first floor business. You're saying on the, sec on the second floor? No, on the first oh, floor, oh, okay. at the same level, on the street level. A lot of places try to attract people up to their businesses, and there's still a limit as, as to how many total signs based on frontage, I guess. <coughs> um. Given the way our uh, downtown, because that's really what we were thinking about, streets are, or blocks are, if people had them for the first floor businesses with the requirements for glass at the first floor, is there room on the buildings itself? If the second floor or conceivably third floor wanted them, I mean, if you're making changes. I mean, would you really run into problems with the buildings that have a lot of glass? I, um, by I'm just I'm just wondering whether there's a physical limitation. I mean, I think only from you know um, a visual well, kind of clutter. Or, yes, yes. Um, I think. Um, I think it's just I, I, the biggest issue we've seen has really been the, those ground floor businesses that are at the pedestrian level. Yeah. So that's what the way it's there. Yeah, and present, presently, they have to go for approval to the Zoning Board of Appeals right now. So what this does is this just relaxes that restriction a bit by letting them have that bar. <coughs> yeah. I'm assuming this falls into that category where if we wanted to add second floors at this point, we would delay the whole thing. Because it's, it's, it's going further than what we would advertise. Yep. I just couldn't remember what I Um. So, um, there's one blade sign per business. Um, and if there's more than one um, business in the same building, there may not be more than one sign per 20 feet of frontage on the same building. Um, only businesses on the first floor of a building may have a blade sign. So um, I think expanding it is getting more, is less restrictive. So I would assume that would be okay to allow it on the first floor. Yeah, some of them might be worried about proliferation oh, signs right, might yeah. not have showed up. Right. I can take the step at the second floor problem. Um, anyone who installs one of these signs wants them to be seen. So if you've got, you know, like that, you you actually rob this person of the visibility. It doesn't. If there's plenty of room, if there's 20 feet to, for these on the same building, nothing precludes the second floor business from coming to us. And it would, I can't imagine that we wouldn't say yes in the case where it. If there's space for it. I think the limitation of the first floor is put in because we wondered if there would be a, a proliferation of signs to the point that they were obstructing each other. That's yeah. that's all I would offer. It doesn't say you can't have them. It says you can't have them by right. Exactly. So you know, yeah, to have to that's a substantial burden to have to file. What would be a, a flat special permit? Or well, in this that's case, it's the burden. Like well, but but I will say, and zoning board can only grant additional signage if they're there. If you're proposing a sign where they're otherwise allowed. So if this says they're not otherwise allowed. So I would argue that they wouldn't be uh -huh. eligible for a special permit. It's only if it's bigger or. Um, an additional sign, but I, I think I, most of the, there are some obviously second floor businesses that have walk-in clientele, but it's not the same type of, typically on your ground floors, really you're capturing the market that's walking by, and typically second floor is for, um, you know, doesn't necessarily have that same demand for Grabbing people off the street. Um, yeah. Should that be between the landlord and the tenant? Well, no, I think the issue goes back to how much signage can you really right. fit on a building right. without changing the entire um, streetscape. Public work. And so would it be a first come, first serve? So if there's a, a sign and a second sign uh, is, uh, if you only, you would have less than 20 feet. Yeah. Okay. Eventually you'd use up. 
the right. available square yeah. footage in right. the front of your building, right. you know, somewhere before it looks like a porcupine, you're going to run right. out of the square footage right. for these signs. Right. And the next part of the second floor discussion is sort of this is a big expansion, and so it's sort of it's the go slow approach. We haven't allowed this before, allow this now. If you know a year, you come back and say this is great. Let's add second floors and basements. There's no reason you couldn't do it. But you get to test. The other thing too is sort of in terms of running out of sign real estate mm -hmm. on the first floor. People could this doesn't preclude you from adding two businesses to one sign. So you're still within the square footage, but you have, mm -hmm. you know, so you're not. Um, so you still have that ability under this provision if that came to that. And I'm going to go through the motion of asking for public comment on this one, but Andrea was the last member of the public here, and she gave up on us. So there is no public to comment on this one, so we have asked. Um, what's your pleasure on this one, Plenty? Um, I think. Um, pleasure. Close the public hearing for this. For you. For, the, for this one item. For the third item. Third item. And uh, I'll entertain a motion to do that. So vote. Motion second to close the public hearing on blade signs. Any more discussion that we want to have about it? Anyone vote on it? Entertain a motion. Amend the zoning ordinance section 7.4 to allow larger by right blade signs in this district. Second it. All in favor? Opposed? So noted. And uh, in ordinance, are we? I'll make the close of the public hearing. Sorry. All in favor? All right. Yeah. Maybe we we'll we'll send this with a positive recommendation. Uh, more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I think that wraps up our agenda. You can fight over the debate in a second. All in favor? Aye. Great. Thank you.